Hi there and welcome to the Byline Podcast with me, Adrian Goldberg. This time, what just happened in the aftermath of Donald Trump's election victory? Many people are still trying to work out how a convicted felon and serial bankrupt accused of inciting an insurrection could have won the US election. Donald Trump didn't just edge a victory over Kamala Harris, he won decisively. Is democracy now under threat in a country which has long stood as a beacon of freedom? Let's talk to Joe Walsh, former Republican congressman who once supported Trump, but who long since has been calling out the president's elect. Joe hosts the Social Contract podcast. Joe, welcome. How are you doing, man? Good to be with you, my friend. Look, I'm bummed. I'm not super surprised, but I'm really, really disappointed. And I'm scared because unlike 2016, everybody knew who Trump was this time around. And America chose him. I mean, they chose a bad, bad person. They knowingly chose a bad person to be president. Kind of a weird, scary place. I've just come back from D.C. and recorded a podcast there with Heidi Sigmund Kuda, who runs the Radicalized podcast. And She was saying we cannot underestimate the role of Russian disinformation, the psyops that have been focused on the United States from outside forces, and also the role of Elon Musk's Twitter, or X now, as well in radicalising people against democracy and decency. Is that how you'd see it? Yeah, I feel like this is all happening in slow motion. Like, I feel like this country is being attacked and our democracy is fading away and it's all happening right in front of us. It's happening in slow motion and most of the American people don't get it. I spent three months, I was on the ground in a battleground state after another campaigning for her, talking mostly to independents and Republicans. And Adrian, I had every single one of them tell me like they know who Trump is, Half of them said, I don't care, Joe, because of the border, or I don't care that he overthrew an election because of my stock portfolio. But then there's the other half of Trump's base that wants him. And I don't think the world realizes this. Half of his base wants an authoritarian to be president. They've given up on democracy. Most people don't understand where we are. I think that is really frightening, isn't it? And uh... I read an article, I think, that you had linked to, which showed that if you put various polls together, certainly a third of Trump supporters appear to be indifferent to democracy. Not that they don't care about it absolutely, but that in certain circumstances, authoritarianism would be an option for them. The idea that in the United States of all countries of the world, as I say, this incredible beacon of freedom and liberty for people all around the world, the idea that a significant number of people in the United States would be willing to sacrifice democracy for authoritarianism, it does my head in. It's done my head in for six years uh, because I publicly came out against Trump six years ago. And since then, I've talked to his supporters every day. And if I had a dollar for every time one of them said, "Uh, Joe, I know he wants to be a dictator, but I want my America back. And Adrian, they've given up on the democratic process to get them that America back. But then like this past weekend, I was with most of my family and some friends, most of whom all vote for Trump. And they're not MAGA crazies, but they basically just said, I don't care, Joe. I know he lies all the time. I don't care. I know he talks about imprisoning his political opponents. I don't care. These are smart, educated people. They're not MAGA MAGA crazies, but they don't care about this important stuff. And so I don't know what's worse, the true believers who want an authoritarian or the ones out there who just don't give a damn. I was talking to people like that when I was in the States, Joe, people I would regard as moderate Republicans, people perhaps like you were before you turned against Donald Trump saying that there were key issues that the Democrats ignored or didn't 
deal with sufficiently. One of those was immigration, that when Joe Biden became president, he took a much softer view towards immigration at the Mexican border than Trump had. The consequence of that was that 7 million, the figures may be questionable, but 7 million undocumented migrants came in to the United States to be duly processed, but nevertheless, 7 million undocumented migrants. Of course, it's true that subsequently Biden and Kamala Harris attempted to toughen the border restrictions and the Republicans torpedoed their attempts to do so, partly to use it as an electoral weapon. But was that Biden's original sin? Did that end up costing Kamala Harris her chance of the White House? Big time. (laughs) I mean, big time. And look, I'm a border hawk. In a way, the election was like this. This was the story. This was all about working class America. And a demagogue who lies to working class America about immigration defeated a political party that's ignored working class America for years. And this has really bitten the Democrats in the ass. The American people care rightly about immigration. Trump and MAGA lie about it, right? They're eating cats and dogs. They're committing crimes everywhere. All bullshit. But again, as you said, for years, Democrats have ignored it. Democrats have looked down on working class people who have concerns about it. Biden came in promising to be the anti-Trump on the border. He literally invited people in. And by the time that bill came up last year, it was way too late. It was too late. Uh, The die was cast that Democrats don't give a damn. That guy may be lying about shit, but Democrats don't care. Yeah. So that's part of the reason why people may be indifferent to the dishonesty and the various wrongdoings of Donald Trump. They look at the Democrats and they think, well, they're not doing anything for me in this particular issue that I care passionately about. And I was thinking of parallels between the United States and Angela Merkel, allowing one million Syrian migrants to settle in Germany and the European Union and freedom of movement, which Britain embraced more heartily than any other part of the EU. And I'm somebody who's pro-migration. I am the product of migrants myself. But nevertheless, if you have a migration policy that doesn't take into account the feelings of your existing population, if you don't manage it properly, you don't have to be anti-migrant to have questions. Yes, Adrian. And if you ignore it or are indifferent to the concerns of regular Americans, you pave the way for a demagogue like Trump. Look at that whole issue. Remember uh, Springfield, Ohio, all the Haitian migrants. Here you've got a Midwest town in Ohio of 60,000 people. And over the last five years, 20,000 Haitian migrants have settled in there. These are all good people who are here for a better way of life. The people who live in Springfield, Ohio, are good people, but it's created real economic and security problems. Trump and MAGA look at that, and they demonize the migrants, right? They're committing crimes, they're eating cats and dogs, and that's all ugly, ugly stuff. But this is happening in towns and cities all over America, and Democrats just didn't give a damn. That's why Democrats now like have the reputation in this country as the party of the elites, the wealthy, college educated. And that's totally flipped. Ten years ago when I'm in Congress, Republicans got all the college grads. Now it's flipped. Well, indeed. Very interesting you say that. I heard almost exactly that phrase from an 83-year-old former Democrat supporter in McLean in Fairfax County in Virginia who was manning the Republican stall at an early voting booth, he said exactly that. The Democrats used to be the party of the working class. The Republicans are now the party of the working class. And he saw Trump as the embodiment of that. The other issue that was raised with me, again, by mainstream Republicans, or what would previously have been considered mainstream Republicans, because, of course, MAGA is now mainstream, but previously mainstream Republicans, was the economy. We know that the United States economy has done well. It has grown. But real incomes 
have fallen. Which is a shame because there's an abundance of employment opportunities out there. Look, I'll connect all of this. I think Kamala Harris did the best she could do. I thought she ran a great campaign. I placed a lot of blame at the feet of Joe Biden. Every talking point of the economy is Biden's fault. You said it. We've recovered better from COVID than any other industrialized country. It's not even close. But Joe Biden never communicated that. When Joe Biden got elected, he should have sat the American people down right away, given a speech right away, and said, we're coming out of a -a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. This is what it's going to look like economically. We're all in this together. It's going to be bumpy. Stuff is going to cost a lot. Boom, boom, boom. And he should have communicated with us throughout the last three or four years. But we never had that because Biden, by the way, was too old and he's incapable of communicating. So the American people never really kind of knew the economy. They felt what they felt, but there was no context to it. And again, by the time Harris became the nominee, that economic die was cast. Interesting you talk about Harris, yeah, because to me, she seemed whip smart. She was bright. There were Republicans who suggested they didn't really know what she stood for, but she was anti-Trump, which for many people was good enough, but not for enough people. Was that a fair assessment or did she have a clear program, do you think? I think by the end, people should have understood who she was. If I have one criticism of her, and I said this from the beginning, The minute she became the nominee, she should have gotten in front of everybody. Every media outlet held press conferences, held town halls with voters every single night, gone on with Joe Rogan, Tucker Carlson, Hannity, everybody. But they tried to protect her. They tried to keep her in a bubble for a long time because I think some of them believed Trump so bad that they can ride this enthusiasm vibe and how bad Trump is. But it needed to be more than that. Adrian, maybe you and I are alike. Donald Trump tried to overthrow an American election. To me, that's like disqualifying. But there are a lot of Americans who think January 6th was a good day. But then there are so many voters who say, okay, Joe, January 6th wasn't a good day, but eggs cost too much. I did speak to one Jan Sixther before the election, part of this nightly vigil at the D.C. jail, saying that if Trump were to lose the election, and of course he didn't, if Trump were to lose the election, he would support an overthrow of government. I mean, you got people, this is somebody who'd served time in jail, by the way, for his role in the January 6th insurrection, had been sentenced, I think, to, to three years in jail, but still talking revolution on the streets of the United States. Adrian, Trump's going to pardon them all. Trump will pardon them all. Let's talk about Trump's policies then once he's becomes president on a daily basis, of course, because he's president-elect at the moment. He hasn't actually assumed power. Which of his policies do you fear that he will enact first and which will be most dangerous? I think he's going to move on this mass deportation that he talks about right away, because that's a really big deal. And I also think he's going to move right away for Putin and try to do something to end that war and cut off aid to Ukraine. If I'm an immigrant in this country or I'm a Ukrainian soldier, I'd be very, very afraid of this next president. He's talking about 11, 12, 15 million illegal immigrants. Who knows what the number is? I I mean, how do you actually enact that? And how do you enact it without bloodshed? Because people who may argue that they have a right to stay in the country, people who just may feel they want to stay in the country and aren't going to be pushed around, the visuals on that, physically removing people using what? The army? It's like a, a nightmare scenario. And Democratic governors of states and mayors of cities who will say no. And you'll have law enforcement in certain places who will say no. You know, we talk about revolution coming to America. If this has been building, but I could see this one issue getting very violent if Trump really pushes it. And we're not even talking yet about the devastation 
it could do to our economy if you took 11 to 15 million people out like that. My hope is, because Trump's an idiot and he doesn't believe in anything, that it's like the wall, right? He was going to build the wall from border to border. He built like two feet of the wall. My hope is he'll pick 20 illegal immigrants who are violent criminals and throw them out, and that'll be the end of it. You touch on a really important point there, I think, Joe, because beneath the rhetoric of these violent, lawless, undocumented migrants, which has been the narrative of MAGA, many of those people, perhaps most of those people, will have been working in the United States economy trying to better themselves, as American migrants have done for generation after generation, and trying to build a better life for their family. So there are parts of the United States where if you take out those, I would guess, typically low-paid workers, where there are going to be jobs unfilled, there is going to be production capacity, which is going to be unfulfilled, factories that won't get all the work done that they need to get done. Has anybody tried to calculate the economic impact of it? Yeah, the numbers are huge. It would be a huge hit it would send this economy into a tailspin. Look, uh, Trump's beginning to hire people, and a lot of them are bad people, and they're true believers. My hope is there'll be some smart economic people around him to counsel him on this. And then my other fear is if he really goes hog wild with his economic tariffs, that could lead to real devastation too. But the problem is he's a one-termer. Like, Trump didn't think he was going to win in 2016, so he really didn't know what he was doing. Trump now feels validated, and everybody is kissing him. Every Republican now is kissing his ring. So he's unchained. He has no guardrails. So I think he's going to try to do some of the worst, ugliest stuff he can do. You touched on this already, Joe. If you're a a Ukrainian soldier in the trenches, you would be very, very worried now. I know that as we speak, Russia has launched a new offensive in Ukraine, presumably emboldened by Trump's election. Trump's vice president-elect, Vance, has already said, hasn't he, previously, that he doesn't really understand what the United States is doing backing Ukraine. Is it feasible that the United States would simply pull all funding to the Ukrainian military? I thought I read today the current Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, said there will not be another Ukraine aid bill. Remember, the Republicans now control all of Washington. I feel worse for every civilian in Ukraine and every Ukrainian soldier than I do for any American with what is going to happen these next four years, because every freaking American knew what this guy would do because this guy told you what he would do. The the hurt and the pain that this will cause Trump voters, I could give a damn. But man, oh man, Ukrainian soldiers didn't ask for this. And I want to apologize to the rest of the world for how Trump will try to get us out of that conflict completely. I was chatting to a cab driver last night in Birmingham, uh, in England, who said, well, at least you'll stop the war. And I thought, well, and just debated with him. I said, well, look, he might stop the war, but he only stopped the war at the expense of Putin getting what he wants in Ukraine, which is large tracts of land. And, of course, Putin won't stop there. It's wishful thinking to imagine that Putin will stop there if he gets what he wants in Ukraine. Someday, maybe when you and I are long gone, somebody's going to write the book on what specifically Putin has on Trump. Someday. (laughs) Again, I draw parallels here with Brexit. And in the eyes of many people in the UK, Brexit was an act of willful self-harm by the British people because it caused direct economic damage to the UK. And there are people even now, bear in mind the vote was in 2016, who will say, we don't care. We still stand by Brexit. Brexit is still such a toxic issue in the United Kingdom, despite the evident economic damage that it has caused, that Labour would not discuss it openly in the most recent general election. 
And um, look at the willful self-harm that you're describing the American people have visited upon themselves because the economic self-harm of attacking migrants, America's role in the world as well, it may well be. Let's say that in the short term, Trump broke his peace in Ukraine, but at the extent of allowing another powerful actor on the global stage, Russia, to take a giant leap forward, that will damage the United States' standing as a global superpower. Effectively, it's the US saying, you know what, we don't want to get involved in this anymore. Now, there may be many occasions in the past where people would have looked at the US's role internationally and thought the US should get the hell out of there. But it does have a role. And if it isn't taking that role and playing an active role internationally, there will be other actors out there who will happily fill that void. Donald Trump, my friend, is a reaction to what the status quo has been for so long. We're too involved around the world. We're not taking care of our people at home. We're not defending our border. And then you got all of this woke gender stuff and everything else. And so Trump is the lash out. Trump is the punch in the face to all of this, except it's ugly and it's dark and it's extreme. And a lot of Americans are gonna regret where he will take this country. Linked to this, there were some very strong comments by John Podesta at the COP29 conference, pointing out the president of his country has called climate change a hoax. It's hard to imagine John Podesta surviving very long as the US representative at COP29 or on climate change. But again, the United States has an opportunity to be a world leader, to lead on the technology of transition around climate change, but it seems willfully to be turning its back on that. And again, an act, I would suggest, of willful self-harm. Politically, I've never been a neocon, and I'm not someone who wants America involved all over the world, but we lead by example, and we have the biggest, baddest military, and we use it when we have to. But the base of today's Republican Party, the base, and Trump reflects it, is build a wall around America, keep people out, and keep America out of the rest of the world. The party right now is driven by a real dangerous nationalism and isolationism. But climate change knows no borders. Completely. And so the base is also driven by an absolute absence of truth on the climate, on our elections, you look at every single issue. Donald Trump's greatest legacy is the destruction of truth. He's gotten people to believe things that are not true. Joe, you've commented on the oath of allegiance that people have to take. Tell me about that. Just explain that to a UK audience. Every member of Congress, like myself, Every member of the executive branch, every member of a court, we all take an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States. We all pledge fealty to the Constitution. Trump hinted at this a while ago. He's going to try to implement it. He's going to try to get to where everybody put in the executive branch has to pledge loyalty to him. To him. Again, just anathema to what this country should be. Incredible stuff, Joe. Incredible. Listen, it's been great to hear from you. I presume with your social contract podcast, you're going to still be fighting the good fight. And by fighting the good fight, I don't mean specifically fighting the anti-Trump fight, but just fighting the fight for truth. Yeah. Because it seems to me that that is one of the most obvious casualties in this time and in this election. I can't tell a lie. The last week, I wish I were still 40. I'm not 40. But after this election, I've really thought long and hard about, well, the hell with it. The country chose what they chose. I've got, if I'm lucky, 20 years left on this planet. I want to go enjoy myself and maybe exit the fight. Maybe I couldn't do that. But there's a part of me that feels America just elected. You call it what you want a dictator, an authoritarian, a strongman, a fascist. We just elected someone who's undemocratic, 
America's going to have to live with that pain, I think. Joe, it's been great to hear from you. Thank you so much. That's Joe Walsh from the Social Contract Podcast, a must-listen. Do check it out. And don't forget as well, if you want to support our work on this podcast, take a subscription out to the Byline Times. The Byline Times is our brilliant monthly newspaper, periodical we call it these days. Head over to bylinetimes.com and you'll find out how to subscribe. The Byline Times has the best of our online articles and content you can't read anywhere else. This episode has been produced in Birmingham, UK, by me and Harvey White. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon. Cheers now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.